Okay, this is the second video in the CNIM, CNIM crash course from interoperativeneuromind.com. I'm Joe Hartman, and I'm also with Sentient Medical Systems. So we're continuing on with the SSEPs. Now we're going to focus on the upper extremity SSEPs with the uh, guidelines from the ACNS and ASNM on things on how to set things, set your program up, what to stimulate at. So we'll get into that now. So the number of trials suggested is 250 to 1,000 by the ACNS and 500 to 2,000 by the ASNM. Uh, I personally don't stimulate anywhere that many times. It, I don't find it necessary, but those are the numbers that you need to know going into the CNIM. Analysis time or the total time that you have on your screen. So we usually break it up per division. So in the lower extremity, you might look at uh, 10 per division and have 100 milliseconds analysis time because you know that your corticals are going to come in right around 40 milliseconds. Well, for the upper extremities, it's 40 milliseconds and 50 milliseconds according to the guidelines. Pulse width is 100 to 300 microseconds. Stim rate is 2 to 8 stimulations per second, and it cannot be an integer of 60 and not an even number uh, that has to do with the 60 cycle uh, hertz of the most common frequency of noise in the operating room in America. So in America it's 60, over in the UK it's 50. And if we have something that's an integer, integer of 60, we're more prone to be in unison with those uh, frequency of hertz and we're more prone to the artifact. Stimulation rate according to the ASNM is two to five per second. Now, general guide or general consensus in the upper extremity says that you should not stimulate over nine uh, nine times per second in the upper extremity. In the lower extremity, it, if you stimulate that fast, you'll start to see uh, some cortical degradation or amplitude reduction. So you can't stimulate up to nine. You, uh, everybody says don't go above five. So five times per second for the lower extremity, nine for the upper extremity, and then you know you can go way, way faster if you're doing bears. Okay, stimulation intensity, 30 to 40 milliamps is kind of a general guideline. Uh, stimulation intensity has also been shown to work well with the peripheral responses, most notably uh, herbs point. So you stimulate until herbs point amplitude no longer increases in size. And the reason for that goes back to the first video where if you increase your intensity, you're not firing on an axon anymore uh, or st stimulating an axon more. You're just stimulating a greater number of axons. And since this is a peripheral response with no synapses, we have a pretty good indication of all the axons that are being fired uh, at one time as they are additive uh, building that evoke potential response so that if we stop increasing in our herbs point, then we are, have stopped increasing in the amount of axons that we are summating. And that's the rationale for it. And another stimulation intensity guideline is twice motor threshold, which is usually around six to 10 milliamps. So if you stimulate at around six to 10 milliamps, you'll just start to see some twitching going on in the hand. If you double that, then they call that your motor threshold. Uh, so that puts us at 12 to 20 milliamps. Um, I'm not sure about you, but for me, I see better results when I go a little bit higher than that, and that's even with needle electrodes being stimulated. So for me, I believe that to be low. Impedances, they need to be less than 5 kilo ohms for both stimulating and recording electrodes. Uh, back when they used to do the jelly and the electrolyte on the uh, stimulating pad, they would really scrub the area and do an impedance check and make sure they got good impedance. And then our stimulator pads got a little bit better or people started using needles. And I don't really see anybody checking impedance on stimulation anymore. Um, I think if you did, we probably would have more people going away from the stimulation pad and going to straight needles uh, just because we have, uh, I guess it depends on the size of the pad you're using, but if your impedances go up a little bit when that sticky pad starts to come up a little bit or the higher resistance through that uh, thick skin that you might not have scrubbed off as well, uh, 
I think that you would see a little bit higher impedances than what we suspect. But there are also some new equipment coming out that actually has that on the impedance checks, which I think is nice. For stimulation, we use monophasic rectangular pulses. The bandpass, this is our filter settings, is between 30 on the low cut and 1 kilohertz on the high cut, which makes it a difference of 3 decibels. Or the low cut for 30 hertz and high cut for 1,000, uh, up to 3,000 if trying to record the far field uh, P14 subcortical potential from the upper extremities. So you need to widen your uh, bandpass a little bit to get that. Uh, bandpass is equal to 30 to 100 hertz to 250 to 3000 hertz for corticals and 30 to 100 hertz and 1000 to 3000 hertz for subcortical. I personally have a pretty tight uh, bandpass when I'm in setting my filters just because the operating room is a hostile environment as far as artifact is concerned and it does take quite a bit of filtering in order to get rid of that noise. If you over filter though you're going to miss the amplitude or the signals that we're trying to collect so it's kind of a balancing act but I think most people if they look at what the guidelines say and how I write my programs they would probably say I'm a little bit more on the aggressive side of filter settings. Notch filter is typically off. I can think of maybe one time in my career where I looked at it and it's worked. Uh, usually it, it, it doesn't help. And interleaving potentials to increase recording time. And interleaving just means it doesn't stimulate everything at the same time. It will stimulate the left hand, then left arm. I'm sorry, the left hand, then the right hand, then left leg, and the right leg. If you have all, all four uh, extremities set up, So name that wave. The generator points are named with either an N or a P, which means negative or positive. A negative wave is a peak, and a positive wave is a valley. The number represents the latency of the wave, or how long it takes to get to that generator point. And the amplitude is peak to trough, or trough to peak, and the time of the slope is the duration. So if we come over and look at our waves here, these are typical waves that I think most people are very used to seeing in the OR. So we have Herb's point, which typically comes in at 9 milliseconds and is a negative peak coming from the top down to the trough is our amplitude. The N13 from a cervical reference to the FZ or FPZ uh, comes in at N13 and a cortical response is our N20. And we will dive much deeper into all these uh, generator points in just a second. Here we come down to some definitions. First, we start off with our stimulus, and then we have an absolute latency of a wave, which is from the onset to the beginning of the, the wave. And then we have an interpeak latency, which just measures from one part of the sinusoidal wave to the next. Upper extremity, upper extremity generator points. So if you have ipsilateral to contralateral herbs point montage or EPI to EPC, allows for recording the proximal peripheral volley of the brachial plexus. The posterior to anterior cervical derivation of uh, CV6 to AC records a negative postsynaptic potential generated segmentally in the dorsal horn. Both the parietal and frontal non-cephalic montages reference to the contralateral shoulder, or PC to SH and FZ to SH, record a series of positive far, field, far fields reflecting the passage of the ascending volley through the plexus, P9, the dorsal root entry zone, P11, and the cervical medullary junction of P14. Remember that far fields are typically Ps. Note that the P14 wave itself comp is composed of two peaks giving rise to the P13 and P14 complex. All right, so now let's come over and look at the picture. Here we have parietal contralateral reference to FZ, which is a typical montage that most of us are used to seeing, namely because it, it 
gives us a nice bipolar setup, which gives us a nice cortical response and gets rid of all the far field responses. If we have FZ, which is a frontal territory to the shoulder, we lose our N20 response because remember the active area of this is over the parietal lobe as we saw in this active electrode here. So when we have it frontal, we see this uh, poor response or an isoelectric response or even an inverted response, but we get this later cortical response that is frontal in nature, this N30. Are you going to get asked that on the uh, CNIM? I really doubt it, but that's just for your clarification. What this far field response is also good at doing is picking up these uh, other far field potentials. I'm sorry, what this referential montage is good is picking up these far field potentials, looking at our P9, our P11, and our P14, or areas through the plexus, through the dorsal root entry zone, and the cervical medullary junction. If we are now looking at our parietal over a far field shoulder, we again have our N20 response as well as our uh, far field plexus responses. If we come over and look at our cervical response to an AC joint, here we have another far field response in the brachial plexus, but we do not have any kind of cortical response that we typically see. If we reference this to the FZ, we would probably see our N13, and right around N20, we'd also see some semblance of a cortical response. We might also see a little bit of the P14 overlap uh, from the far field cortical response. And here's our typical herbs point. Okay, the rest of the sentences say only the contralateral parietal electrode, the PC, records the somatosensory complex, the N20 to P25, arising from primary somatosensory cortex, while the frontal electrode, the FC, records the phase, in phase inversion of these two potentials, followed by a cortical negative wave, the N30, reflecting precentral activation. The bipolar Parietal frontal montage, the PC to SC, eliminates all subcortical far field activity and isolates the parietal N20. This montage yields less information than those using non cephalic or earlobe references, but is more resistant to aggressive environments such as the ICU or the operating theater. So, according to our guidelines, we have obligate points. Uh, these are ones that they recommend be used on our cases. Uh, obligate meeting, you need to have it on there. So we have our typical upper extremity SSCP, CPC or the contralateral to the ipsilateral. We have a nice N20, bipolar montage, no far field responses. Here we have the CPI or the parietal ipsilateral to the uh, contralateral herbs point. And here we are picking up our far field subcortical P14 and N18 response. Then we have our cervical response, which is our C5S, or the spinous process of C5, reference to herbs point contralateral, and we have a nice cervical response. And herbs point is the ipsilateral to the contralateral. So if we had the question here, how many electrodes would you need to record these four channels from the median nerve? Well, you would need one for each herbs point, one over the cervical spine makes three, and then one over each cortical area, so five, and then, of course, a ground. Herbs point. So now we're going to get a little bit deeper into each generator point. This is the nitty-gritty stuff that they will sometimes ask on the CNIM. So it is an obligate peak. Herb's point is anatomically described as the union of C5 and C6 roots. So as we have those roots coming in from the brachial plexus here, and as they adjoin, this is Herb's point right in there. Now much of that is dependent upon your electrode placement, because when you place your Herb's point, it should be somewhere uh, 
in the rostral area to the clavicle, middle clavicle, pick up that response. But remember, remember this is a traveling response. So what if you put your electrode distal to the clavicle or caudal to it? If this person did not have a lot of pectoral muscles, you could still pick up a response. It would be the same response. It just might be a little bit earlier in latency. An active electrode is placed on the ipsilateral herbs point located two centimeters superior to the midpoint of the clavicle. And your reference is the same on the other side of the body. The near field recording is an action potential volley traveling over some poorly understood location in the brachial plexus. Poorly understood it, it, just because we can't localize it to a definite spot since it is a traveling uh, propagated action potential and location matters of your recording electrode. Triphasic positive negative positive waveform characteristic of a peripheral nerve action potential. If there are nerve root lesions, the herb's point will remain intact if the cell body is still intact. It monitors mainly the orthodromic sensory but also has a motor component in it. It has a great signal to noise ratio, so we don't need to replicate a lot of uh, sweeps in order to achieve a, a reliable herb's point. Smoothing is problematic because of the fast frequency activity. That is a question right there. It stumps a lot of people. It, it asks which, which generator or which waveform is most likely uh, affected by smoothing. And then it will give you herbs point and cortical and subcortical. It is the peripheral herbs point that is the most problematic. Yeah, it's used to verify adequate stimulation, like we said before, when herbs point no longer increases in size, you've met your uh, maximal stimulation and then maybe go 10% higher than that. The blood supply in the area of herbs point. So the nerve roots of the brachial plexus gets blood supply from the branches arising from the vertebral artery and ascending cervical arteries. In the trunk of the brachial plexus and the, the trunk and the cords, it gets the transverse cervical, subclavian, and axillary arteries. Branches of the brachial plexus get subclavian and axillary arteries. They will ask you vascular supply to generator points and anatomical areas. I do not think that they will ask you vascular supply of the brachial plexus simply because there is. Uh, a lot of variance and a lot of different uh, supplies depending on if you're talking the, about the proximal or distal portion of it. So Earth Point records mostly sensory but will have response with peripheral sensory loss because also monitors motors yet often difficult to obtain in people over 60 years old. You may need to try the N5 at the elbow. So that is also a good area to get a response is at the elbow and it suffices and it gives everything that you would need from a peripheral response. So here's a math question that kind of asks you to put some of your knowledge together. This is something they might do. There's not a ton of math. Most of it happens to be on the component side of things. But if they do ask you questions and you can figure this out, then you should be able to answer other questions. So if you have a true N9 herbs point and you know that the conduction speed is typically between 40 to 60 meters per second and they give you this uh, latency, you can pretty much figure out what is going to be the length of that arm. So at 9 milliseconds of your time, average conduction speed of a peripheral response is 60 milliseconds or 0.06 meters per millisecond equals nine milliseconds times 0 0.6 meters per second or, zero, or equals 0 0.54 meters. Convert that into feet because we're uh, in America here and it's 1.77 feet. N13, this is, is typically done with your C5 to S to FZ you can do C2 to FZ, 
you can do reference to some other non-cephalic area like herbs point or an AC joint one. The negative, it's negative when recorded over the posterior neck and positive when over the anterior. So if we come look at this picture here, we have SC5, SC5, our regular N13 response. If we look at D, which is D here, we have a P13 response. The reason for this, it is a, the generator itself is a horizontal dipole, whoops, with the negative component going posterior and the positive component going anterior. When we have our recording electrodes along the side of the neck here, we get some uh, some positive and some negative effect on the N13. As we see, our nice large amplitude is starting to flatten out here a little bit, and we pick up some of these other uh, far field responses. So the N13, P13 is a dorsal horn uh, I wrote postsynaptic, but it should be presynaptic. No, I'm sorry, it is postsynaptic potential that is elicited by contralater contralaterals of the primary afferent fibers in the lower cervical cord. A second potential with the same latency occurs at the level of the cervical medullary junction. It possibly arises from the cuneate nucleus. This gives the N13 both near and far field potentials, though I would choose near field if I saw it on the exam. The C5 uh, spine to FZ montage records a large N13 potential that is likely an average of the uh, standing dorsal cord potential and the P13, P14 far field potential recorded by the scalp electrode. The N13 potential can be recorded in all normal subjects. So this is a very stable, very reliable uh, potential. It is a near field response, so the closer you place your recording electrode to the uh, generator point, the better your potentials will be. I know some people will go ahead and stick their cervical response either pre-auricular or post-auricular on a regular routine basis. Um, this diagram here shows when you have it off to the side, what happens to your amplitude. It starts to flatten out. And what happens when you go more anterior, you start to pick up some of this more anterior portion of the horizontal dipole. And the largest area is coming from this generator point here. You're probably losing out on almost all of it when you have such a high recording electrode. And you're probably only getting that far field potential from this uh, secondary response likely to be up there by the cunate nucleus. So my suggestion is if you can always put it down in the neck. I know on ACDFs you don't want it to be in the picture. So my preference is to still be in the posterior aspect of the neck and just slide it slightly lateral so it is out of the way of the imaging. The N13 is an obligate peak. It is a postsynaptic activity in the cervical cord. The blood supply is the posterior spinal artery. And remember that there are two posterior spinal arteries compared to only the one anterior spinal artery. When you think of the posterior spinal artery, you shouldn't think of it as just a, a couple of segments of arteries coming in and feeding that posterior dorsal horn. It's more like a, a web, a vertical web that climbs up and down the backside of that spinal cord where there is just a ton of redundancy in vascular supply. The chances of uh, having a vascular deficit to the posterior aspect of the cord is very low because of these redundancies versus the anterior portion of the cord, which has only that one uh, supply, which is not built like this web-like uh, structure or vascular structure in the back of the spinal cord. It has these feeders that can sometimes are reliable to feed multiple segments coming from that one branch. Uh, 
and areas of ischemia that affect the spinal cord are more likely to be in the anterior portion of the cord. All right, back to the N13. This is a stationary, non-propagated response meaning it doesn't matter where you stick your recording electrode. If you're recording this generator, it's always going to be at that same uh, latency. It is a near field response. So if you move your electrode far away, you're going to get a horrible response. It is the horizontal dipole with the negative uh, pole going posterior and the uh, positive going anterior. It's referentially recorded since we either do it off the shoulder or off the FPZ. And it is the start of the central conduction time in the upper extremity. It's very stable and it's very reliable. So the central conduction time, we look at when the propagation becomes uh, part of the central nervous system. So when it's herbs point, it's still peripheral nerves. When it's still that far field uh, P14 that's picking it up from this, uh, the dorsal roots, and the cervical roots, that's still peripheral nerve. But when we have the N13, that's the beginning of this postsynaptic uh, gray matter of the posterior horn. It then travels up the cord and synapses on these thalamic cortical projections, these thalamic cortical synapses, which is our near field N20 response. So this N13 measures the full central conduction time or the time it takes to get from the very start of your, your central nervous system to the end of it. Now they try to use this on carotids to see if it was a more sensitive indicator than amplitude loss. Uh, pretty much everything that they tried to implement it with or test it against seems to be inferior to our, our typical 50-10 rule. P14, this is the far field response that is the subcortical uh, response. Now, just that last slide, I said P14 from the brachial plexus. That is a different far field response, which gets a little bit confusing, but that's why you have to look to see where your electrodes are set up. That far field response is more, uh, it comes from that, that setup where we have the frontal to the hand or, or the knee or, or even the shoulder to some extent. But this P14 is the one that's coming from the area of the foramen magnum. And this is the one that is considered an obligate peak as well. So P14 is the far field potential seen in the cephalic non-cephalic reference, not recorded below the level of the foramen magnum and does not reach the thalamus with shoulder reference most likely represents a response near the foramen magnum as the dorsal column is becoming the medial lemniscus and the peak of the wave corresponds to the arrival of the volley in the thalamus. If you use an ear or nasopharyngeal reference, the area being recorded by the P14 response is more rostral, is the more rostral medial lemniscus. So again, there is multiple generators to this response. Uh, the P14 is the exact same generator uh, sources as the P31 in the lower extremity. P14 continued. It comes from either the propagation of action potential volley in the medial lemniscus and or dorsal horn and or the postsynaptic responses of the cunate nucleus. The P14 is preserved in patients with thalamic lesions that abolish subsequent scalp scalp components following the stimulation of the contralateral limb. So that just means we know it's not at the level of the thalamus, it's, it's caudal to that. It's used in the same channel as the N18, which will be next, and the blood supply is the vertebral basilar artery. So if we have a picture here, we stimulate the SSCP through the brachial plexus, through the cervical nerve roots, synapses here, this is kind of our N13. This is now, well, this is the N13 if you have more of a C5 uh, active electrode. If you have more of a C2 active electrode, then you're a little bit more rostral up here. The P14 response is as it summates on these uh, 
cunate nucleus or or and or as it changes directions and becomes the medial lemniscus and or others other areas of this medial lemniscus but is not at the thalamic level so that is quite a large territory that we can get a response from but that is how far field potentials work okay using p14 using different electro positions and different generator points in a patient with a low-grade astrocytoma of the mid pons in the region of the right medial lemniscus the left median sscp shows preservation of p14a and p14b but loss of p14c so these are just now they're labeling these other components or these other areas of the generator point p15 and the cortical n20 potentials are also lost the right medians sscp potential is normal nc denotes non somatic reference so here we have our normal right response which has all of our uh, far field components to it here is our ablation of the right medial lemniscus at a certain level but we still have the p14 most likely in the area of the cunate nucleus and the decussation of the dorsal column n18 or our cpi to epc this is also an obligate peak, and this is from the ACNS. Uh, if you don't know, the ACNS is more of the uh, diagnostic world, where the ACNM is more of the uh, intraoperative world, but the CNI will pull from both references, which makes it a little bit difficult, but uh, it's an obligate peak according to the ACNS. It's a far field potential. It's possible contribution from the thalamus it is preserved after thalamic lesion and is thought to arise from multiple generators, multiple generators in the brainstem. It's best recorded referentially from the scalp electrode ipsilateral to the stimulated nerve away from the contralateral N20, used in the same channel as P14, and its blood supply is the vertebral basal artery. So if we have this similar picture here, we have our P14 here. It comes all the way up, but not till here. This N18 also is in this pontine mesencephalic and now thalamic area. So this other, you know, second leg of this long brainstem pathway is the multiple areas of generators uh, causing this N18 response. The N20 uh, response from our CPC to FPZ is a the most likely channel that you'll get a good response with this. It's an obligate peak. It's bipolar derivation, uh, subtracts the widespread far field signals, for example, the P14 or P18, recorded locally over the central parietal region, contralateral to the stimulated median or ulnar nerve. This is a near field potential. The blood supply is the middle cerebral artery or the MCA. And the end, it is the end of the central conduction time in the upper extremity. So here we have uh, the same picture we've been looking at. Bipolar cort cort cortical to cortical gets rid of all those other far field responses and we have a nice cortical response. Here we're looking at a, a coronal slice of the brain and we see the MCA uh, blood supply to the parietal lobe area. If we remember our homunculus man, the legs are in the middle and the trunk and face and, and arms is out in the uh, lateral portion, which is supplied by the MCA. The ACA supplies the midline areas. We also have deep branches from the MCA, which dives into the uh, internal capsule, the thalamus, the basal ganglion, supplies different areas of those. So if we are doing something like a carotid and we have EEGs and SSEPs, the EEGs are just monitoring the more distal cortical electrical activity. 
where the SSCPs is monitoring the cortical response as well as these deep penetrating branches of the MCA. So it gives a, a, a nice redundancy on the cortical response and measures something that the EEG cannot because of the depth of the uh, neuronal structures. P22 from CPC to FZ. This is not an obligate. It's useful with phase reversal though. This wave is also generated in the cortical structures, but is more widespread, seen throughout the frontal cortex bilaterally. It peaks one to two milliseconds later than, than the more localized parietal negativity, or the N20 noted above, and may arise from the direct connection between the thalamus and a pre-Rolandic cortex. Later potentials are well known and include P27, the N30, and P45, those are these uh, pre-central postsynaptic cortical responses. They are clearly state dependent. The generators of many later potentials are usually attributed to activity in the cortical association areas. These waves are affected greatly by inhalational agents. So our P22 we use commonly on the phase reversal. That's where they place that recording grid over the uh, pre and post central gyrus, we're looking to see where our primary somatosensory strip is, where the central sulcus is, and where the primary motor strip is. In the primary uh, sensory area, we will have our typical N20 from these thalamic cortical projections, these, this near field response. The P22 is a thalamic cortical response as well, but th those projections are going to the precentral or the frontal lobe area. Uh, so it has a slightly different latency as well. Here's something to consider with somebody that has uh, an amputation and is undergoing phantom limb pain. Uh, they will have cortical reorganization of uh, their somatotopical areas. So here is our normal, uh, what we suspect to be normal with the feet midline, our trunk and body, then our hand, face, and tongue and all that. If we amputate an area, this area that was represented by the arm will now have a shifting inward and a reorganization of what this uh, gray matter will start to uh, function with. So this is with somebody that has a limb cut off, but we have smaller variations of that or, or not as uh, pronounced. How about somebody that has a carpal tunnel syndrome and they have compression of the median nerve at the wrist? We tend to look at the hand mostly and think, well, he's got sensation loss, he's got muscle wasting, and then we kind of forget that the pathway goes both ways. It also goes back up towards the, the central nervous system. Uh, so if you look back on my blog, I get into a little bit more about the reorganization of central structures in people with carpal tunnel syndrome and why we may elect to use uh, an ulnar nerve in some of those cases for things like phase reversal uh, or even just general uh, cervical spinal cases. So go ahead and, and look that up on the website a little bit later to get more information on that. So summarize, here we go. Here's your summary for the upper extremity SSCP pathway. The impulse propagates peripherally, resulting in muscle twitches, and centrally via the peripheral nerve and the dorsal root of the spinal cord. The nerve cell body is the first order neuron that lies in the dorsal root ganglion. Impulses then ascend primarily in the dorsal column fibers of the spinal cord, which synapse in the lower medulla near the nucleus gracilis and cuneatus, respectively. Axons of the second-order neuron cross the midline at the cervical medullary junction from where they regroup to form the medial lemniscus and synapse in the ventroposterior lateral nucleus, or the VPL, of the contralateral thalamus. The third-order neurons from the uh, VPL leave the thalamus and travel through the posterior limb of the internal capsule uh, 
is the thalamocortical radiations to synapse in the primary somatosensory cortex in the postcentral gyrus of the parietal lobe. You should have that down pat. If there's something in that paragraph that you say, oh, I don't know what that word means, go look it up. This is the pathway that we use for SSCPs. SSCPs are the most common modalities. SSCP is going to be a large chunk of your test. Make sure you have that down to the fact where you could, you should be able to say that and rehearse that and draw that like this picture here. Here's the summary for upper extremity SSCP generator points. N9 is our brachial plexus act activity or action potential, which we have right here after the dorsal root ganglion. Spinal medulla, or N11 is our spinal medulla dorsal root activity or the dorsal root and cuneate nucleus uh, activity, far field potential. N13 is our dorsal uh, funiculus activity, the postsynaptic gray matter activity right in the dorsal horn there. The P14 lemniscal tract and nucleus activity, the lem lemniscal nucleus and prethalamic lemniscal medial act uh, activity. So here we are on the cuneate nucleus, the decussation, and the rise of the P14, just not all the way to the thalamus. The N th N18 is the thalamus posterior lateral uh, nucleus activity. Again, all the way from the pons up into the thalamus is our N18 far field response. N20 is our parietal cortex activity. N13 is our parietal cortex activity, postsynaptic activity. Roughly speaking, the response enters the spinal column after 10 milliseconds after the stimulus and reaches the cortex after 20 milliseconds. So that if you're free, for some reason you forget some of these numbers, just think, cut it in half. Uh, you know, if you know the N N20 is your cortical, it takes about N N9 is your ERP point, so it takes about 10 to get all the way into the cord, and then you can kind of work from there. Alarm criteria: If we see a reduction in amplitude of 50%, or we see an increase in latency by 10%. A prolonged central conduction time of one millisecond is also considered significant. The N9 to N14 conduction time, which reflects transmission of the proximal brachial plexus, the cervical roots, and the dorsal columns, does not have an alarm criteria. That is typically used for diagnostic purposes if you have some kind of avulsion or you have a, a tumor in that sec that area, like a pancose tumor coming from the lungs, compressing on, you know, some something in that area from a diagnostic standpoint. Greater than one millisecond change in the N13, P14 to N20 central conduction time or our near field P13 to our N20 uh, response. This represents pure central conduction time between the dorsal column nuclei and the primary somatosensory cortex. Increase in side-to-side -side latency greater than 10%. So if you see that change happen during the case, that's a significant change. Or if you see that difference uh, pre-surgery, uh, but at baselines, that is worth noting. Dispersion of SSCP suggests desynchronization of the nerve action potential analogous to that found in demyelinating disease of peripheral nerves but you cannot make that call off of it. So if it's desynchronized, you are more likely to lose your fast conducting fibers first. You are then likely to have a wider range of conducting speeds in that nerve, which makes you more likely to have a waveform that is prolonged in a complete onset, as well as this have poor morphology. If it's not repeating at the same time, it doesn't have that additive effect that we get when we uh, have an SSCP. So we have this flattened, poor morphology, long duration waveform. So I just threw this in here. This is from one of my other slides, uh, changing my seed during the portion of the case. So if you're doing an ACDF and they start retracting on 
to open up the uh, incision site in order to better visualize the disc and uh, the body of the spinal vertebral column. Here's what it looks like from a cross section. So this is the surgeon's side over here. This is their point of view. This is their retractor pulling in, and that is the carotid artery. If you have a carotid artery compression and you do not have a uh, circle willis capable of perfusing the side that has now been occluded, then you can have cortical changes ipsilateral to the side of carotid compression. Very similar to a carotid endorectomy where they clamp down on the artery and we look to see if they have any kind of uh, loss of perfusion. If we look at the contralateral side, we have a whole lot of other uh, meat in there before we start compressing the artery. So it's more likely to have happen on the surgeon's side. If you do see that, the uh, obvious treatment is please stop retracting. Let's see if it comes back. Distraction pins, they will put those in there, open it up to widen up the disc space. If you have a, a patient that is very stenotic, any kind of this uh, movement can cause further stenosis, which can cause compression on the cord and cause changes in your signals. Same thing with a graft. The grafts are designed to stop before it gets to the end of that body. Uh, we've all heard the stories where they're banging in the graft and then motors are lost or SSPs even are lost. Um, so sometimes the bone doesn't do its job in, in stopping it short. Patient positioning. You can see this patient sitting on a rolled up towel giving the surgeon greater exposure to the neck, but also causing the patient to be in a hyperextended state. You could have a change due to a myelopathic cord, which is stenotic and is now being compressed further. You could have a change from the brachial plexus or the nerve roots being stretched in this kind of position. The C5 nerve root is the shortest nerve root in the cervical spine and is most likely to be uh, injured in these uh, cervical cases. And as luck has it, the L5 nerve root is the shortest one in the lumbar region and most likely to be injured. Uh, so that works out well for you for remembering that. Other things that can happen is if we place weights on the head, have it that positive Y translation to open up that gap in the spinal vertebral column, or we could have taping of the shoulders, taping down, again, increasing risk to those nerve roots or uh, plexus areas. We shouldn't see any kind of vertebral artery occlusion, uh, or the, the likelihood of that happening with this straight on is very low. If you were to ever have that, it would typically be with rotation added to it, causing this stretch on the vertebral artery and possibly uh, closing it down. All right, name that lesion. This is a 31-year-old female. Sensory nerve action potentials are absent, so we know that the sensory portion of the nerve is poor. She has a normal cortical SSEP, a very minor to almost negligible N13 cervical response, a poor herbs point, and a poor elbow. So both peripheral responses are bad. And the patient has a history of bulimia or anorexia. So in patients with severe sensory neuropathies, a relatively normal scalp SSCP can be obtained because of central amplification of the peripheral afferent volley, even when the peripheral sensory nerve action potential is absent. If the scalp latencies are within normal limits, it can be inferred that the peripheral sensory nerve conduction velocities probably are markedly slow. So this is a different kind of uh, lesion that we're typically seeing. We're used to seeing, you know, peripheral's good, peripheral's good, cervical might be good, might be bad, and then loss of cortical. Well, this would be uh, something you would see at baseline. It wouldn't be a change throughout the case, but it might throw you for a loop. Name that lesion again. The left median SSCP in a 17-year-old uh, man with Frederick's ataxia. The N13 to N20 interpeak latency is prolonged at 11.3 milliseconds. 
Normally, it should be 6.7 milliseconds. The N9 to N13 interpeak latency is normal. So we have our ERDs point to our cervical, normal response, peripheral nervous system, okay. Start our central uh, nervous system responses, N13, N20, prolong. Uh, something is happening within the spinal cord. Now we come and look at our lower extremities. The tibial scalp potential in the same patient as the above picture are low amplitude, and the P38 latency is approximately 52.2 milliseconds. The N22 to P38 inner peak latency is quite prolonged at 28 milliseconds, normal 20 milliseconds. So here we are having a couple of different issues. We have a very poor response. We have prolonged interpeak latencies from our uh, beginning of our cauda equina response, our N22, up to a uh, cortical response, our P38, which again shows something is wrong with the central cord. This is an upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron lesion in this uh, classical presentation of Frederick's ataxia. The lower motor neuron lesion has deep or absent deep tendon reflexes. So when you tap their ankle, if it was just upper motor neuron lesion, you would see a hyperreflexia or they really kick really hard. But since there's a lower motor neuron component as well, there's absent. But then when you look at their uh, extensor plantar responses, they have an upgoing toe, which is an, up, an upper motor neuron lesion. So it has kind of this uh, double appearance to it. They are often weak distally. Uh, a lot of times their feet start to bow up because of loss of uh, muscle activity. The dorsal column, they have a loss of vibratory and proprioceptive sensation occurs. So we can see the dorsal column is highlighted here as well as some of these other lateral cortical spinal areas, and that is Frederick's ataxia. We, if you work in a pediatric center, you might see these kids in there for surgery because scoliosis is also uh, common with them. So what are th some things to consider when looking at SSCPs from case to case? So what's the conduction velocity of the central nervous system? At birth, you have 10 meters per second, whereas an adult, you're at 50 meters per second. So we can see down here in our little graph here, at birth, we have a very slow, up to eight months, we have quite a rapid increase in conduction uh, velocity. And then by eighth year, we're pretty close to a, an adult level. So in very, very young kids, we may have problems recording and getting anything reliable. By eight months, maybe even a little earlier, we start to see something uh, in SSCPs and then some reports of MEPs and, and D waves as well. The speed of conduction again slows as we enter elderly age. So as we continue to beat up our bodies, we start to lose those large diameter afferents. We have a reduction in myelination around the nerve and we have slowing of the nerves. Peripheral conduction speed increases to adult level by age three. Spinal cord conduction speed increases to adult level by age five. Median nerve cortical SSCP latencies increase by 0.015 milliseconds per year. And the tibial nerve is even uh, faster, a rapid decrease. So this starts to come into play when we have the 80-year-old, uh, you know, five-foot lady that comes in. We expect having very short limbs that we should have a, a shorter latency, but then all of a sudden we have a prolonged latency. And that's just because over those extended years, we've had a slowing up conduction of the nerves. Does temperature affect SSCPs? The central conduction time increases by 6.6% per one degree decrease in temperature. The upper SSCP equals 0.8 milliseconds per degree uh, Celsius increase in N20 latency. The lower is even worse at 1.15 milliseconds uh, per degree Celsius increase in the P40 latency. Cortically generated components are recordable at a temperature above 26 degrees Celsius.
where uh, usually disappearing between 20 and 25 degrees. We are sometimes in some of these uh, vascular cases where the perfusionist is in the room and they're cooling the patient down. They're trying to make sure that uh, the patient is protected and we want to see EEG go isoelectric and we might even see our SSCPs go all the way down as well. So that is actually fair game to ask for on the CNIM. Peripherally generated components are elicited at 20 to 21 degrees Celsius or above. Note that the peripheral response at the brachial plexus recorded at Herb's point is delayed to 12 milliseconds instead of the normal 9 milliseconds. This delay shifts the subsequent peak out by 3 milliseconds or increases the absolute latency and is most probably due to peripheral neuropathy but could also be due to a very long arm or cold arm. So that is where a history and uh, a physical exam comes into play before we jump the gun and call it due to peripheral neuropathy. So is SSCP for neck cases enough? We'll go into motors after we go through the lower extremity SSCPs, um, but they might, SSCPs might not be the best in some cases or enough in other cases, uh, or it might be sufficient in other cases. So things that we have found that warrant multi multimodality monitoring is uh, preoperative diagnosis of cervical spondylitis with myelopathy, so that's one, ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament, tumors, uh, an instable spine from trauma, if the surgeon is going to need to do a corpectomy, and then for EMG standpoint, the, the C5 nerve root is the shortest nerve root, most susceptible to injury during uh, neck surgery, and recorded more in the posterior spinal fusions. C5 nerve root injury is as common or more common even than spinal cord injuries, so we should be monitoring EMGs as well. So if we look at our CT scans here, this posterior longitudinal ligament runs on the backside of the bodies, but anterior to the uh, spinal cord itself. When we have ossification of it, it becomes nice and hard and brittle and maybe even sharp and can really wear down that front side of the cord or compress it in a uh, stenosis. Here we see a, a herniated disc going backwards causing significant compression. So this is our myelopathy. Here we have an unstable neck. Uh, we can see the cord compression here. This is a grade four spondylolisthesis at C4-5. Typically, you only see this spondylolisthesis in some kind of bad uh, fracture or trauma. This, this patient probably had his facet joints jumped. And here we see a corpectomy was done, and we have the fusion here, which increases the likelihood of uh, post-op deficits and warrants an MEP. Dermatonal SSCPs. So the standard position of placement of stimulating and recording electrodes used to obtain dermatonal SSCPs. So here you would want to use these dermatonal SSCPs more for uh, peripheral nerve monitoring than you would central. Anytime that you record just the sensory portion of something, the amplitudes are going to be smaller. So that's one disadvantage. Uh, in other words, you, you can only do one at a time. But here's where they used to do these a lot, and they, they tried them out. And here's where the stimulating sites were, the C4 up here in this uh, upper shoulder deltoid, bicep area, C5, C6 on the thumb, C7 middle finger, C8 on the ring finger. Electrodes were placed 2.5 to 4 centimeters apart with a dermatonal region. The cathode is proximal to anode. Stimulation needs to be very low, just above the level of sensation, to avoid stimulating adjacent dermatones or underlying structures. So, submaximal stimulation, I don't know if that's going to work so great, doesn't 
seem to work great for SSEPs. I don't know why it would for uh, dermatonal. A 200 microsecond pulse width, 2 to 5 hertz rate, so very similar to SSCPs. More averages will be needed because these are smaller waves and has a poor signal to noise ratio. We'll only tell you about the sensory portion of the nerve. Can only require one nerve root at a time. Has poor reliability under anesthesia and will not detect a breach in the pedicle from a screw only if the injured, uh, only if it's injured by on the nerve already. So it's not really that preventative, but more predictive, uh, if that at all even, because of all these other uh, negatives that go against using dermatonal SSCPs in the operating room. So a normal response recorded over the scalp between the vertex of CZ and the contralateral C3 and C4 electrodes to dermatonal stimulation of the L5 and S1 territories on either side. In each case, the average of 512 responses is shown for each trial, and two trials have been superimposed to demonstrate rep, uh, that it can replicate of the findings. An upward deflection indicates positivity at the CZO, CZ electrode. So that is another uh, negative, is if we're using these to monitor peripheral uh, nerves, but it has to go all the way through the central area, uh, then it's more likely to be knocked out by something, either myelopathy or, or what, whatever it might be. Sensitivities of these uh, DCEPs range from a high of 60 to a low 10%. The possible reason is the length of the, the track from stimulation to cortex is very long compared to the site of compression at the nerve root, which could uh, more than make up for the slowing of conduction speed. Okay, that's it for this video on upper extremity SSCPs. I showed you last time uh, my LinkedIn profile, so this is my Facebook profile. Uh, actually, on this one as well, sometimes on the, the LinkedIn, I have some uh, different information or links to textbooks or something like that, that I don't have on the website or might not be in the newsletter either. So please go over to my Facebook page and give it a like. That way more people can stumble upon it or see your like and more people might be able to uh, add to our forum as well as go through some of this training as well. All right, that's it for this video and we will see you on the next one.